Why did he go? I mean, considering everything was going so smoothly, you weren't detected, you you were flying back th through India, you had made two, three stops in India. Why did Kim Devi decide to leave at that point? Or disappear? Well, we by the side of, yeah, we were parked by the side of the runway, and the aircraft was refueled, all the rest of it. Even the aircraft airport manager, deputy manager, asked us why we'd landed. He didn't, at that stage, know we'd been instructed to land. He was quite cross, actually. Um, and um, there was a big argument between Kim Davy and the airport deputy airport manager because the airport was insisting on landing fees. And Davy was saying, but you ordered us to land. Why should we pay landing fees? But in the end, he agreed to pay them. And we the aircraft had been fully refueled. Uh, so probably about $1,000 worth of fuel there. So he set off. He went with the deputy manager of the airport to the terminal to pay for the fuel and pay the landing fees. And on the way there, he must have passed a couple of lorry loads of police because they arrived at the aircraft about 20 minutes after he left. Uh, and we were on the opposite side of the runway to the terminal. So you had to drive right round the runway to, to get back to the terminal, you see. So it's a long journey. And he must have thought that the aircraft had been spotted as the Perulia plane. But actually it wasn't. It was just customs coming to do a routine search. Um, but he must have thought it was everything was over. And I assumed he just went and bought a ticket and got another aeroplane. I, I don't know anything about how he got out of India, but that's the last I ever saw of Kim Davy until three years ago when I saw him in Copenhagen. Uh, never heard another word from him after that. And you were arrested at that point, right? Yeah, but I was arrested for immigration offences. Right. Um, so where did the link go? Sorry? When did they link you to the Purulia drop? Well, not till I told them that the aircraft was the plane they were looking for for Purulia. Uh, I was questioned for two or three hours, and it was getting quite boring because I was rep repeating myself time and time again that we haven't smuggled anybody. We were forced to land. And finally, I was faced with a couple of people who were clearly from Delhi. They were clearly important people. And I'd come to the conclusion that Niels Hulk, uh, Kim Davy had definitely gone. He'd left. Uh, and I thought, it's now safe to talk. And these guys were from Delhi. So I told them the story. I said, look, this is the aircraft that you're looking for. And they didn't believe me at first. So I said, well, look, if, if we go to the aircraft, there's still a couple of guns hidden in there, and I can show you where they are. And so we went to the aircraft. I lifted the floorboards, and there were a couple of Dragunov sniper rifles in there. And um, that then they were convinced that this was actually the aircraft, but it was only when I told them that it was the aircraft that they, you know, that, that, that they believed they didn't believe me at first. That I had to show them these guns. So after that, you were taken away, right? So you wouldn't really have an idea of what was going on in the media and what role the Indian intelligence was playing at that time, or did you get? Not, not at all, no. I mean, we were kept in the airport for a couple of days, and then suddenly we were flown to Kolkata and chucked in um, Bidhanagar police station cells there. Uh, from there we were transferred to CBI care and we, we went into jail. But it was, must have been four months before I saw a newspaper or heard any news reports. And nobody was allowed to talk to us or tell us anything. I had no idea what was being said in the media at all. It came as a huge shock um, to be pulled up in front of the magistrate and suddenly discover I was being charged with waging war against India. Um, you know, nothing prepares you for that because, uh, you know, I wasn't as stupid as I looked and I knew that was a really serious offence. Uh, and I just simply couldn't understand. So now we know that, you, you know, you were there for nine years. We do know that the British High Commission and your government uh, put a lot of pressure on the Indian government. Now, having said all this, what do you think, what is your story? What really happened? Why did the Indians not stop the plane at any one of the stops that you had made before and after the, uh, uh, after the you know, drop? Well, since there's a lot of reasons. I mean, I, I've been talking about this for years now. The record shows that I haven't really changed my story very much. The revelations that have been made by Kim Davy only have served to confirm to me some of the things I've thought for a long time. Uh, I started to realize that something was very strange uh, for two reasons. Firstly, 
in the CBI headquarters in Kolkata, I, I told you I'd been questioned by dozens of people and everybody seemed to be getting a different version of the story. So I insisted that I was given a computer and I wrote out the full story, it ran to 30 pages. Uh, and then I handed that full statement, ex every detail of what had happened, I gave that to the CBI in Calcutta. But in court, when it came to court, they denied that that statement had ever been made. But when I read the charge sheet, the charge sheet was obviously written from my statement. And then I was given, as the law requires, copies of all the evidence. And I, I started to see all the problems with the evidence. And the first thing that I realized was that the massive Indian Air Force radar at Kalikunda had been switched off that night and that night only. Uh, and that rang a bell why suddenly Kim Davy wanted to deliver those guns on the night of the 17th, because I now know that he knew in advance that that radar was switched off. That was the real reason it had to go that night. Um, lots of other things. I, the British Special Branch officer who came to see me in my office altered all the documents relating to that and completely changed the meaning of all the documents. But somebody else in England, and I, and I yet don't know who that is, saw to it that before it came to court, I got copies of the original documents. And during the trial, no less than six senior police officers were charge sheeted, um, show caused for fabricating false evidence. You know, that tells you there's something wrong. There's a bit of a conspiracy going on. Yeah, I know. Really I, I know it's a there. major conspiracy. But the other, you, the yeah. most... The most interesting thing of all is in that 30-page statement, which essentially says exactly what I've said to you now, but in far greater detail. Um, nobody has ever uh, pointed out the fact that straight after giving that, I was subjected to a whole day polygraph testing on that statement by the CBI. And that polygraph test indicated that I was telling the truth. But that statement has been suppressed. That's never been shown. The results of the polygraph test have never been made public. And also, the CBI commissioned Interpol to investigate this and write a report on this from the European angle. That was done by a Swedish police superintendent called Krista Brannerud. His report um, was then classified, and the CBI refused to allow that report to go into evidence. So what's happened here and people may believe my side of the story or not but on that evidence alone it's pretty clear that something very serious has been covered up here when did you first um, hear about the Anand Margi when did you hear about the Anand Marg organization was it before or after you were arrested oh after I was arrested I, I never heard them I was questioned many times you know were these guns for the Anand Marg and I had no what are you talking about? I, I've, I've never heard of this organization before. Uh, I didn't know anything about them at all. Um, I didn't even know w w which religion they pursued or anything like that or where they were based. It, the only time I, I learned something about them was because um, there was an Ananda Margi in jail with us and charged along with us. He was one of the accused, a chap called Vinay Kumar Singh, who was uh, a Bihari. Um, and, of course, he was acquitted at trial because the judge found there was no evidence against him. Um, but that was the first time I learned anything at all about Ananda Marg. Um, uh, I'm afraid I'm not a person that spends a lot of time looking at different religions, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, no, but when we, you know, the whole thing that you're saying, that there is proof and you, are, you believe that the radar was switched off, on that particular I night, so it's, a, it's a very clear indication that there was a government level conspiracy yeah. supporting oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mike. I, yeah. If, if I can just mention on that point, there, it's not a case of me believing it was switched off. I personally cross examined the Air Force officer on duty that night. Uh, he was a witness in court and he admitted on the record, in evidence, on oath, that that radar was switched off that night. That's, that's an absolute fact. It's not an allegation of mine. Um, it, was, it was an assumption I made from the written evidence, but when I cross-examined the uh, officer in question, that's when it was confirmed it actually was switched off. And who, who now, when you look back, and the information that you have gathered, who was that, uh, you know, that 
drop meant for? Was it for the Anand Marg? Was it for another organization? And why did they need these arms? Well, I think so. I mean, uh, again, you know, I'm not a follower of Anand Marg. Please don't, please let's not go there at all. But from what I've read, there is a great deal of animosity between Anand Marg and between the CPIM government of West Bengal. I don't know how much is true, how much isn't true, but I, I've listened to what Kim Davy or Niels Hulk, as he's now known, has said about this. And yeah, those things that he alleges do stack up. That there is a record of that in the press. So I'm assuming there is genuine animosity between the two. I think it's highly possible that they may have been used for this. They somebody may have seen there were a suitable organisation to give arms to. I don't necessarily think it was their idea, um, but. <laughs> I've got to admit, it's pretty obvious that I was kept in the dark on a lot of things. Um, well, they would not have been in a position to switch off the radar. So obviously, it might not have been just their idea, right? There's nobody in any way connected with Ananda Marg, from what I can gather of this organization, who has that kind of influence. Yeah. This has to come from somewhere else. You know, um, I, I don't think I'm being impertinent when I say that India is paranoid about national security. Um, this is a hugely powerful radar that looks into the northern areas, into Bangladesh and stuff like that. You can't switch that off just like that. This is impossible. Um, you know, it's just, it's just crazy. Uh, you have to have a great deal of influence and power to be able to switch off a radar like that. So what you're saying is really that the Anandmar was a conduit, or uh, just a conduit maybe, for a much larger conspiracy, I, right? I think so. I think that sounds the most likely thing. I have to say, I don't know that of my personal knowledge. But, you know, you know, by, by profession, I was originally an intelligence analyst. So I should be able to at least speculate reasonably. The evidence, the hard evidence that came out in court that is t attested to on oath indicates there was a serious conspiracy of some description. When the arms are dropped right slap bang on the doorstep of uh, Ananda Nagar, it's difficult to see how there wasn't some intention to supply arms to there. Uh, if it was for some other group somewhere else, then surely um, they could have gone somewhere else. But the one thing I've always said is that if, if Ananda Margis themselves wanted if this was an Ananda Marg conspiracy and they wanted these guns it would have been far far easier to drop them within their huge compound at Ananda Nagar right. it's a massive compound yeah. and it wouldn't have mattered what altitude the plane flew at even if it went wrong it would have still fallen within that compound so the fact that that didn't happen suggests to me that this wasn't an official Ananda Marg conspiracy People involved may also have been Ananda Margis and things like that, but I don't think it came from their leadership. So it is like you have said in other interviews to destabilize the left front government in West Bengal. I mean, the whole intention seemed to be that. I was told right at the very beginning <clears throat> that the arms were meant to attack a communist, a, a communist state government. At that stage, I was unaware that West Bengal was such a government. Uh, now I know a lot more about that. There is another work, communist government, but it's an awful long way away from uh, Perulia. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't seem a very likely candidate, does it? So, and, you know, just given the, all that's happened... Just one more, a uh, couple more questions. One is on, you know, after your release and even the years that you spent in jail, but more so after mm. your release, you must have spoken to the MI5 guys as well. What is the explanation uh, about, you know, or what is the conjecture, if you want me to use that term, uh, about the role of the Indian intelligence in this entire thing? I've got to stress that nobody from British intelligence has spoken to me since I came back to the UK. Uh, <laughs> well, okay. Uh, we, we, we'll accept that. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, they haven't, What's genuinely. I, yeah. I, I'm, and I'm quite surprised at that. Uh, there is a book um, written by a lady called Annie Matchen, who is the former girlfriend of um, uh, a renegade MI5 officer called David Shaler, whose name you may well be familiar with. Uh, he's a convicted traitor. He sold MI5 secrets yes. to the Mail on Sunday. 
Uh, it is pretty certain that David Shaler was the MI5 case officer for the Perugia business. I haven't been able to talk to him yet. Annie Matchin in her book accuses me of being an MI6 agent and accuses me of plotting the entire Perulia case to embarrass MI5. I have to assure you that that isn't true. <laughs> um, it's a difficult question, um, but, you know, MI5 must have passed the information through their Indian counterparts. MI5 certainly wouldn't pick up the, the telephone and and speak to somebody in the uh, central government cabinet. They, the, the conduit is through their opposite number in India, and there must have been very close liaison. Um, I know there's a great deal of rhetoric. There was a gentleman who was hugely offended by the thought that intelligence agencies might do anything untoward at all on Times Now television the other day, spluttering. But the reality is that... Um, all our intelligence agencies occasionally get up to some pretty disreputable things. Uh, that Nobody is exempt, neither, not the Indians, not the British, not the Americans. All our intelligence agencies get up to stuff. It's what they're there for. Um, so I can't see how they weren't involved. You can't do this. this I, I, I wrapped up a, an interview with somebody else some months ago, before all this business with Kim Davies extradition came up, and I simply said, look, when you look at the facts, none of this could have happened without a great deal of involvement of intelligence agencies and people with huge influence. Uh, similarly, an intelligence agency alone cannot get the radar switched off. That's got to be a political thing. So it's across the board. All I, I'd love to find out the truth. Um, you know, I'm not looking for sympathy from Indian people. That's that's not what I'm here about. Uh, but I, I, you know, from my personal point of view, I, I do want the truth. It cost me eight years in jail. Um, I think on that basis alone, I deserve to know what the truth is. I also think the people of West Bengal, who would have been the victims of this, deserve to know the truth as well. It's outrageous in democracies that governments like the Indian government and the British government should behave like this because the British government knew what was going on. Whatever happened, they knew about it. Similarly, the Danish government knew about this. Um, the Danish security service has declassified a lot of documents in recent years. One of those shows that only a few days after I gave the information to MI5, the Danish security service briefed fully the Danish justice minister. And they did nothing as well. You know, we, we, here we are fighting a war on terror all over the world, ostensibly, and doing all sorts of things in the name of a war on terror. And yet here, when everybody's told there's a terrorist action about to take place, everybody looks the other way. Now, it doesn't make sense, I'm afraid. You, know, you can't have both. Either we have a war on terror or we don't. If we do, this has got to be looked into. Right. I think on this note, we will end this. Thanks so much for giving us your time.